Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. I'm Ronnie Blumenthal, the Executive Director of the Phelan McDermott Syndrome Foundation, and I want to welcome you to the latest of our online conference sessions. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping before I introduce our speaker. And uh, the first thing I want to do is thank our sponsors, because this would not be possible without them. Uh, our gold sponsors today are Turner's Tribe, uh, in honor of Turner Jones and the Robert and Eva Worthy family. And then as our silver sponsors, we have AMO Pharmaceutical, Autism Brain Net, Berrios and Associates Inc., Neuron Pharmaceuticals, and we have an anonymous uh, sponsor on the silver level as well. And we thank them all very much for so gracefully uh, changing up their plans and ours from our in-person conference until to this virtual series. Um, we. If you haven't already done so, I really want to ask you to get the app. If you go on either the Apple Store uh, or Google Play, you will find um, under PMSF Conference, our app. And this offers you an opportunity to read the bios of our speakers, to send in your evaluations for the sessions, and especially to meet other people, uh, either in a general way or specific interests. And I encourage you to do this not because it's just a great way to reconnect since we can't be together, but hopefully next summer you may be able to meet in person some of the people that you connect with on the app now. So please consider doing that. When you get there, the access code is 20 PMSF20. So now I'd like to uh, also just remind you there is a Q&A feature depending on your device at the top or bottom of your screen where you can type questions and depending on how much time we have at the end, I will be uh, presenting those questions to our speaker. And today's session is called Behavioral Strategies for Addressing Challenging Behavior. And our speaker is Dr. Nathan Call. He's from the Marcus Autism Center in Atlanta, Georgia, where he is the clinical director. And he has uh, a hearty background in research and issues related to, and clinical trial research related to behavioral uh, challenges. So without any further ado, I'd like to bring you Dr. Call. Now, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, he was with us, as you may know, in Dallas in 2018 to excellent reviews, which is the reason that we've invited him back today. So thank you and welcome, Dr. Call. Take the, there we go. All right. So one quick correction, um, small thing, but you know, I would never want to be blamed for taking credit where none is due. Um, uh, the slide that Ronnie had up earlier said that I'm an MD, which I am not. I'm a psychologist and a BCBA D by training. So I just want to set the record straight on that point very briefly. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Um, I really enjoyed the opportunity to present at the conference in Dallas um, a little while ago. And I actually came back from that conference really energized around um, this group. I uh, found that the, the format of the conference was just uh, a breath of fresh air, the degree to which families and family um, involvement is really just central to the whole organization really struck me in a way that I, I've since brought up to colleagues again and again as a model that I think needs to be replicated uh, far and wide. So really excited to have the chance to get in to meet with this group and, and hopefully it'll be a, a long relationship but we'll have the chance to do this again and again in the future and maybe even in person at some point. Um, I do have to disclose some of uh, the funding for some of the research that I do. I always tell folks this just means that, you know, nobody other than the government's trying to give me money for anything. And so um, I'm not, you know, paid to, to endorse anything or to, to uh, shill for anyone. But if you know anyone who wants to give me money for something along those lines, I am, you know, I, I'm not saying I can't be bought. I'm just saying no one's offered so far. Um, so I want to start out today talking a little bit about challenging behavior and um, and try to lay a little bit of groundwork around this topic of addressing um, problem behavior in individuals with with PMS. Um, and so I'll start with just some fundamentals when it comes to behavioral approaches to problem behavior. And I want to be really clear. I'm going to be talking specifically about behavioral approaches, not so much medication. This is not to say that medication doesn't have a role to play. It just is to say that I don't, I'm not that kind of, of doctor, right? I mentioned earlier, I'm not an MD. And so that's not an area where I have expertise. Um, certainly, I would argue that many of the individuals that I work with and the clinics that I, uh, and the families that I serve, um, medications are oftentimes a frontline approach to trying to adjust challenging behaviors. 
And in, in many instances, those medications have had some effect, but maybe not the full effect that the families are looking for. And so that oftentimes leads to where I get involved. And, and it's not to say that, again, medication didn't have a role. It's just that there still continues to be some need and we're working on behavioral interventions at that point. So I'm going to talk primarily about that. Now, at the same time, when it comes to behavioral interventions, there's a long history of using these types of approaches, right? Through changing the environment, changing consequences for behavior, introducing different stimuli in the environment, lots of different approaches to doing this. And this has been around since you know, the early 1900s. Um, people have worked with individuals with uh, developmental uh, d d um, disorders in different ways, trying to address challenging behaviors. So this is not new. And yet at the same time, I think my experience with a lot of the families when I first meet with them, and I kind of ask, like, what have you tried from a behavioral perspective? Most families have tried something, even if it was informal or even if they don't have the kind of the terminology to describe it, they'll generally say, well, we tried time out or we tried such and such strategy. We tried, you know, ignoring it. We tried a lot of different things. Um, and the other thing that I'll generally hear is, yeah, it kind of sort of worked for a little while, but not very well, or it stopped working after a while. Um, and that may be something that sounds really familiar to some of the folks in the audience here today, because that's something I, I think is, is kind of almost universally true in a lot of instances that these strategies have the potential to work or work for a while, but maybe the results are not as durable as people would like them to be, or um, they're not as big an effect as folks need them to be. And so there's some reasons why that seems to be the case, but I want to first talk for just a minute about some terminology. One of the reasons why these things don't work is that oftentimes these are based on the topography of the behavior. And when I say topography, what I really mean is what the behavior actually looks like, what the form of the behavior is, right? So as an example, you know, aggression is one topography of problem behavior, self-injury, you know, self head banging is another um, Self-injury can be biting or headbanging or self-hitting. You know, I've got kids who jump up in the air and land on their knees. Aggression, you've got biting, kicking, hitting, scratching, head butting, hair pulling, lots of different examples of topographies. And so these are all just different forms of challenging or problem behaviors. Now, when it comes to these behavioral interventions, topography is oftentimes less relevant than one might otherwise expect. Um, and yet it oftentimes is the determining factor over what strategies people try in particular. And so one framework that is oftentimes applied when it comes to developing these interventions is of what I would call a topographically prescribed system of, of developing treatment, which essentially means that if the kid's doing X, then, then the caregiver or the consequence or the environment should do Y. And that really that what, what that treatment is, is determined based on the topography of the behavior. Um, I live in the South and, some, and so I sometimes talk about how when I moved here, I first came across this topographically prescribed treatment where you know toddlers will bite sometimes and parents would say well what do you do when the kid bites and here in the south again the, the thing I would hear is well you should bite them back and I, I've never quite fully understood why biting toddlers is a good idea um, but that's an example of a topographically prescribed treatment right the kid bites that's the topography biting therefore you should do this 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 is the behavioral strategy you should try biting them back now you could use timeout or some other thing, but really in this instance, the topography is what's driving the selection of a particular behavioral strategy, okay? Now, let's think about that from the standpoint of a kid. And that's one thing that if, if you stay awake long enough to hear this whole thing, I would say the one thing that I would ask you to try to remember is to always be thinking about any of these strategies from the perspective of the individual, right? And so this is a hypothetical individual. I'm going to call him Tim. I like hypothetical individuals because they always do exactly what I need them to do to make my point. Um, but let's just say we have Tim. Tim sometimes screams or throws tantrums and even maybe sometimes hits his parents. Now, sometimes he screams and hits when they make him turn off the TV. He's watching television, his favorite show. They come in, they say, time to turn off the TV, throws a tantrum, screams, sometimes hits them. Another time that he sometimes screams is when they make him do certain things that he doesn't like, hygiene tasks, things like brushing his teeth. So Tim, it's time to brush your teeth. Tim screams, he hits, um, and, and that would be a, a second scenario where he screams and hits. Overly simplified, but hopefully this will make my point, right? So going back to that topographically prescribed system of developing treatments, remember problem behavior X equals treatment Y. And so in Tim's case, hitting is the topography. And let's just say for the, the sake of argument that in this case, the strategy is timeout. Okay, so every time Tim hits, he should get put in timeout, right? That's the topography hitting, the strategy is timeout. Now, going back to thinking about this from Tim's perspective. Well, in the first scenario, Tim's watching TV, 
parents come in and say it's time to turn off the TV or maybe they just pick up the remote. Tim screams, hits and tantrums. And so his parents put him in timeout, right? Because top topography is what's driving the strategy in this instance. Now, thinking about that from Tim's perspective, what's he thinking? Well, when I hit, well, I don't get to watch TV. That's kind of terrible. In fact, I don't even get to do anything. I have to go to timeout. Timeout maybe is on the steps of his house or in the part of a room where there's no access to preferred stuff. And so over time, that could actually work, right? Thinking about it from Tim's standpoint, Tim's going to learn, hey, hitting and screaming, they don't make my world better. They actually make it worse. Therefore, he's less likely to continue to do that over time, right? Now, in the second scenario, he's told to brush his teeth. He hits, screams, tantrums, and they send him to timeout, right? Same topography. It's aggression. In this case, it's hitting. So it should be the same treatment. So he has to go to timeout. And thinking about that from Tim's perspective, hey, no toothbrushing here. I'm in the corner not having to brush my teeth. That's exactly where I want to be. That's a great way to avoid brushing teeth or these other non-preferred or aversive tasks. And so in this instance, timeout is really not going to work. And this, I hope, highlights the problem with these topographically um, based strategies for selecting behavioral interventions that it really, that, and I think contributes to this idea of when people talk to me about what strategies they've tried, I hear, well, it kind of works sometimes. The reason for that sometimes is often that it's based on the topography of the behavior. And that topography sometimes will, that strategy will sometimes be really appropriate but in other instances, depending on other factors, it may not. And so that takes me to an alternative approach that takes into account the function of the individual's behavior, okay? Thinking about it from Tim's perspective, in those two different scenarios I just described, that same topography, the hitting and the screaming and the tantruming, serve two very different functions. And that's why in one instance, the strategy of timeout could work because it took into account the function, right? The first example where he's watching television, the function of his behavior in that instance is to continue watching television, right? To not lose access to television, to maintain access to television. And so in that instance, the function of that behavior really um, was the, the purpose of the behavior was unsuccessful. It wasn't successful at achieving the purpose of that behavior. Hitting didn't maintain access to television. If anything, it lost access to other things. But in the second scenario, timeout actually fulfilled the exact purpose of the problem behavior. He was able to avoid brushing his teeth. He got to leave brush, tooth brushing and avoid that for some period of time. And, and that essentially was what he wanted out of the whole deal. And therefore the function of the behavior was fulfilled. And so that's where this idea of function seems to be, or the literature really suggests strongly that function is the key determining factor that, that's, that establishes why one strategy might work in one situation and not another, even though topography is oftentimes much more readily apparent, right? I think about topographically prescribed systems or the systems that we all think of when we grow up, right? That you do something bad and something your parents have a consequence for that. I sometimes say, you know, I've got four kids and, you know, I've got in-laws and we would go visit in-laws. They're very good at giving me topography-based systems, right? Your kid engaged in some problem behavior. Well, the first thing that I always get is, wait, didn't you go to school for all this? Your kids are engaging in problem behavior. You know, you're supposed to be an expert on this, but you know, the toddler's kids have no shoes and that's definitely the case for my family and my kids. But the second thing is that they're always very willing to give me lots of advice. Oh, you know what you need to do? You need to fill in the blank, put them in timeout punish them, whatever, right? And so these topographically prescribed systems are really common, but again, are only intermittently effective. These function-based systems that I'm about to spend the rest of my time today talking about are going to tend to be far more effective and more consistently effective because they take into account the purpose that the problem behavior is serving for that individual. So what do I mean by function? Again, in the case of Tim, Hitting maintained by access to preferred activities like television, time out, right? Again, that could work really well, but hitting that's occurring to escape from demands, following through with that demand is going to be far more effective. So in this case, when Tim hits his parents after they turn off the TV, he goes to timeout. That's going to work. And when he hits his parents after they tell him to brush his teeth, they actually follow through with the demand. They actually make sure that he isn't able to avoid brushing his teeth. Maybe they do it a little bit faster and a little bit more thoroughly. And he isn't able to escape or avoid. And he learns, I have to brush my teeth even if I hit. Hitting's not working. The only way for this to be successful is for me to brush my teeth when I'm asked to. All right. So again, and this is tough for me a little bit because I'm used to getting lots of feedback in these talks, but I'll do my best talking to a screen. Um, when thinking about functions of behavior, 
there are two broad categories, and there are obviously lots of examples within each of these categories, but this may help just a little bit. The first of these categories are what we call social consequences, the things that occur after a behavior, the function of the behavior is to access some consequence that serves a social function. And social in this case doesn't necessarily mean like socialization the way most of us think about it. It doesn't necessarily mean that you know, you're getting lots of attention, although attention is an example of a social function. Social really just means that in the chain of events that lead from the problem behavior to that eventual consequence, someone else is involved and that's what makes it social. So a cookie is a social consequence if it's on the top shelf and mom needs to get it for me. So if a kid hits because or throws a tantrum because they've learned that mom will present a cookie for me or give me something that I couldn't get on my own, that's making it a social consequence, the fact that mom or some other person is involved in the delivery of the actual consequence. It's easy to, easier to understand social consequences perhaps by thinking about the converse, which would be automatic reinforcers or automatic consequences. These are consequences where the behavior just automatically, hence the name, produces that, that consequence. <clears throat> um, oftentimes we think about these as, as more stimulatory types of behaviors, right? One example I can give is I had a kid who was poking at his eye. Um, he had actually disconnected his retina in, in both of his eyes. Um, let's see, sorry, I just lost the screen. Hopefully everybody else is able to still see that. Um, but he lost vision in one of his eyes because he was poking at his eye so much. And when we worked with the eye doctors, one of the things they told us is that he was seemed to be poking at his eye because if you do that, if you push, put pressure on your eye, you'll actually cause the, the photoreceptors in your retina to fire due to a buildup of pressure instead of light striking them, which is what usually causes them to fire. You'll kind of see little flashing lights. Now for this young man, that was kind of the coolest thing in his world. He didn't really like other preferred items. There wasn't, he didn't like snacks or treats. He didn't like screens. He didn't have any toy play skills. He didn't communicate at all. And so for him, that was the most kind of enjoyable thing in his world was to cause himself to see flashing lights by poking at his eye. But that's an example of an automatic consequence or an automatic function, right? Poking at your eye automatically causes those flashing lights to appear. There's nobody else involved. You don't need mom to mediate your access to flashing lights in that way. Um, and so of these two, it's important to note when a behavior is serving a more social function versus a more automatic function, in part because they're just different strategies that are going to be differentially effective for these two different types of functions. Automatically maintained behaviors, just to be totally candid with you, tend to be a lot harder to treat because you have less control over those things that are maintaining the behavior, right? If behavior is occurring to get a cookie, well, you know, mom can give cookies, but mom can also prevent access to cookies depending on whether good or behavior, bad behavior is occurring. But if the behavior is occurring to produce flashing lights and the behavior automatically produces that, there's just less control you have over access to flashing lights. If the kid's successful at poking himself in the eye, he's gonna see him and it's hard to unlink that behavior from that consequence just because of the fact that as a caregiver, you have less control over that. Doesn't mean that there's no options, it just means that it's a different approach that needs to be taken. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along today. As I said, these automatic functions are oftentimes thought to be self-stimulatory, but not always the case. And so we have to be careful about assuming that that's the case. Um, examples like body rocking, stereotypy, some forms of self-injury have been shown to be maintained by automatic reinforcement, but other unusual things like self-restraint. Some kids who kind of, I had a kid who was in, in a wheelchair and he would oftentimes wrap his wrists in the seatbelt of the, of the wheelchair, restraining himself and that we were able to demonstrate that it was an automatic function. Um, they also can uh, occur due to some underlying medical issues. So kids with dental pain, for example, will sometimes push on their jaw or chew on things. Kids with headaches may bang their heads. So it's always important to address any underlying medical issue. Um, it can also just cause general irritability. Kids who are constipated, kids who just don't feel well, they have a cold, they have allergies. All of those things can occur and, and these problem behaviors can attenuate those through automatically producing some attenuation of that general irritability. So function's important. I hope I've convinced you of that at this point. I only have 90 minutes, so I can't spend too much time on that if you're not, but we'll just assume that everybody kind of is following along with me. How does one then go about identifying the function of a behavior? Well, there is a gold standard approach to doing this. It's not something that is always accessible for everyone, but I'm going to talk through it because I think it makes the point of how one can go about identifying the function of behavior, and that's called a functional analysis. 
This involves direct manipulation of the environment, essentially to in, in, intentionally evoke problem behavior to see responsiveness. And so that's why sometimes people think about it like a behavioral allergy test, right? You know, you've got that allergy test where you go in to your allergist and they prick your skin with 50 different things or whatever, and they look for where there's a reaction. That's kind of the equivalent to, to a functional analysis in this case, where you're exposing the individual to different things from the environment to see what's evoking the behavior, what's maintaining. It. This is an example of a graph from a functional analysis. Um, and so it, I'll walk you through this just a little bit on the Y axis, kind of the vertical axis. It's showing how much aggression and disruptive behavior this young man was engaging in. And along the Y axis or the horizontal axis, these are individual sessions. Each one of these little dots or squares or triangles represents a different data point. And each one of those data points is 10 minutes of a session. And in each of those sessions, something different was going on, depending on the symbol that's represented. So I'll start with that first one. You see kind of a closed or dark circle. <clears throat> this was our control condition. This is when this young man had free access to some things that he liked. Nobody was asking him to do anything he didn't like to do. He was getting continuous attention. And if you look, across this, as you look at each of these different closed dots, you'll see that for all of them, they're all right along that horizontal axis, axis indicating that no problem behavior occurred, or at least the problem behaviors that we were trying to record. So he was never aggressive or engaged in any disruptive behavior, so long as that was the state of affairs. As long as he had all his preferred stuff, no one was asking him to do anything, he was getting lots of attention, he didn't engage in any problem behavior. Now, if we move to that next data path, these are the black squares. In these black squares, this represented a condition where access to a preferred item was being restricted. Now, this young man, we knew that he really liked iPads, right? And so when the session would start, he would have access to that iPad. And then a therapist would come over and say, you know what, it's time to put the iPad away. And they would restrict access to that. If he became aggressive or engaged in disruptive behavior, they say, hey, never mind here. And they'd hand him back the iPad for 30 seconds. And then they'd say, nope, remember, it's time to put it away. And they would do that for 10 minutes, kind of going back and forth. Anytime he engaged in problem behavior, they'd give it back. And after a while, they would try to remove it again, essentially setting up an analog to a condition that occurs all the time in the real world, right? In the real world, sometimes you lose access to your stuff. And sometimes people try to take it away or turn off the TV in Tim's case from earlier. And so this is setting up an analog to that situation. It's not the exact same situation because it's a therapist and it's an one iPad and it's exactly 30 seconds. So we're adding a lot of structure around this in order to really see if we can produce the behavior reliably. And that's one of the key strengths of this functional analysis approach that in a real world, there's so much else going on. It's really hard to isolate any particular um, variable or factor and see how it's influencing that kid's problem behavior to determine the function because there's just so much other stuff going on. I sometimes say, you know, you go to the grocery store and you're walking around with your kid and your kid throws a tantrum. And I'm like, well, if it's my kid, I say, well, why today? We come to the store. Well, we used to go to the store all the time and we've never really had problems, but today we are having problems. What's going on? Is it because, you know, we walked past the candy aisle and there was something really preferred there. And so now we're seeing tantrum. Is it because another kid was in another cart and made a face? Is it because, the clerk was talking to him and he didn't like that. It was because there were balloons. There's just so many things going on in a real world scenario that we can't isolate how any one of those factors is influencing behavior. Whereas in this functional analysis, we can set up these analog conditions that very specifically manipulate these things one at a time in that allergy test format, right? And so if you look at these darkened squares again, you'll see, you know, we initially saw a little bit of problem behavior, it dropped down to zero around session four, and then it really took off. And we started seeing almost two instances of aggressive or destructive behavior, or disruptive behavior every minute. And that tells us that there's something going on here, right? That this restricted access to his iPad or preferred items in the form of an iPad here seem to reliably be producing problem behavior. And that this behavior seems to serve the function of getting back or maintaining access to preferred things. Now we had other conditions here. There's this open square, which is really similar to the one I just described, except instead of restricting an iPad, we're restricting attention. The therapist is saying, you know what, let's play together. And then after a little while, all right, I have to go over here and do some paperwork like a caregiver might have to do, or I have to do something else. And they're diverting their attention away. If problem behavior occurs, they're going back and attending to the child for 30 seconds. And you can see problem behavior never occurred when that was the case. The triangles are very, again, very similar, only in this case, both of them are testing out different conditions with respect to demands. One was an academic task, one was a self-care task. So 
dark triangles versus white triangles. And in both instances, it's time to do some work if the child engaged in problem behavior. They say, never mind, you don't have to, kind of like Tim with brushing his teeth. And what we see was that in both of those instances, both of those conditions, regardless of whether it was a self-care demand or it was a academic demand, problem behavior was occurring pretty reliably, indicating that this young man's problem behavior occurred for two purposes. It served two functions. One was to access preferred items. Again, that's that iPad condition. The other was to escape or avoid non-preferred demands, regardless of whether they were academic or self-care types of tasks. So this tells us a lot about the function, which then can go on to inform treatment. I'm going to talk about that a little bit in a, in later on in this talk. Now, Moving on. Now, so that functional analysis, as I say, is really the gold standard. That's if, you know, the best possible way to pretty definitively show with clear-cut data in a really controlled way what the function of the problem behavior is. And there are folks out there who are able to do those types of assessments. I have a center I work in where we have special equipment and well-trained staff and session rooms with padding on the walls in case things get really out of hand and staff who are trained to manage problem behavior and special furniture that we got a prison supply company so that when the kid throws it at your head, you're not likely to get hurt because it doesn't have sharp edges or metal fasteners. And the list goes on and on and on of just how well equipped we are to do those kinds of analyses on a regular basis. It doesn't have to be in that type of a setting. I've conducted functional analyses in people's homes. I've conducted them via telehealth. I've done them in schools. I've done them in the community, out at the store. There's lots of ways to go about conducting these functional analyses, but it does require a certain amount of expertise and experience to do very, very well. And not everybody has that, including people who are ostensibly trained to do behavioral interventions like BCBAs and so forth, not even most BCBAs know how to do a functional analysis. And I'll talk about that a little bit later too, but that is one question to sometimes ask if you're working with a, a behaviorally trained person like a BCBA, specifically to focus on challenging behavior, I sometimes recommend that's a good question to just get at what level of experience they have. To say, hey, have you conducted a functional analysis before? That doesn't necessarily mean that your kid needs a functional analysis, but if somebody's never done one, that gives you some insight into what kind of experience they have, whether your kid need, needs one or not. But regardless, functional analysis is a, is a useful tool. It's a very thorough tool. It takes a lot of time and energy and expertise, but there are other ways to get at some hypotheses as to whether, as to the function that a particular individual's problem behavior can serve. And one of the simple ways to do that is just to ask yourself or the caregiver involved some very straightforward questions that can give some insight into function. Things like, does this behavior consistently occur in certain times or places or settings, right? Yeah, this problem behavior always occurs uh, during recess. Okay, well, what's going on at recess? That helps you kind of ask the second level of questions. Well, at recess, he's expected to be a little more independent. Okay, well, that might be tell us something about problem behavior and the function that it might serve. It always occurs around lunch, all right? Well, that might have something to do with food. Is it when there's a non-preferred food that's presented? That might give us some insight into function. And so then that again is one important question. Another one that I ask caregivers a lot is what would happen if, and then fill in the blank, what would happen if I took his iPad away? You know, I talked to a parent one time and they said, uh, well, you're not going to do that, are you? Right? Don't take his iPad away, whatever you do. This family actually, I, we just saw a kid who constantly had access to 11 different screens at a time. He had three different iPhones and, and um, eight different iPads. And parents couldn't even, in order to get one away from him to charge it, they had to wait till he was asleep because he was so controlling over his access to those screens. And so, you know, families are usually pretty good at telling us, yeah, don't do that. Whatever, all of the things that families are doing to avoid problem behavior, that can do a lot about telling you how to, uh, what the function of the behavior is as well. Another one is just what is this individual trying to say with their behavior, their problem behavior? These problem behaviors, I tend to think about them as communicative, right? They're, these individuals are trying to tell us something with their behavior, oftentimes because they lack the other means of telling us what they want or what they don't want or how they feel. And so these behaviors are communicative in nature and it's just a matter of the modality of communication, not necessarily the message being the problem. Another question is what are some times when the problem behavior never occurs? Well, when he's got access to all his screens, things seem pretty good. It's when we take one away, right? That's oftentimes pretty clear cut. And then lastly, what's the one thing that I could do that would guarantee that the problem behavior would occur, right? Again, a lot of families are pretty good at answering that question because they build their whole lives around how do they make sure that that never happens. And so that oftentimes gives a lot of insight into the function of the behavior. All right, so function is really important. Hopefully I've convinced you of that point. You're gonna see the kind of referencing function more and more as I go through the rest of the talk here today. 
um, but I want to move on just a little bit to talk about interventions in particular and how to use information about function to develop interventions. First, though, I want to just kind of go over a very high level um, description of different approaches to dealing with problem behavior. Now, I sometimes think about this as these are the key ingredients and in every good behavioral strategy really should have certain pieces or elements in all four of these categories if it's going to be effective, if it's going to have the desired impact for the individual and their family. Um, I think in my field, again, I focus mostly in behavior analysis. I train BCBAs and I've worked with a lot of BCBAs in the past, and they tend to really be focused on number two on this list, right? Behavioral interventions, which are the things that you can do such that over time, the frequency of the behavior will decrease, right? And these are the things you can do so that basically the individual is learning that the behavior is not producing the, the, the consequences that serve the function of that behavior so that over time they're less likely. So think about Tim and time out when it came to accessing television, right? Time out in that instance is an example of a behavioral intervention because over time you would expect him to learn that throwing tantrums don't get him access to the television. And so that's not very effective. And so he needs to find another means, right? So that would be an example of a behavioral intervention because it's a set of procedures that over time are going to decrease the frequency or the probability of that problem behavior occurring. And again, I think that's where a lot of people who are trained in behavioral analysis or behaviorally trained are really focused on what is this thing that we can do so that over time this behavior will decrease. However, I do think it's really important and oftentimes overlooked that it's also really important to have other tools in your toolbox. And what, some of those tools need to be focused on prevention. And prevention really is the things that you can do to avoid the occurrence of problem behavior occurring in the first place. Um, you know, there are those times and in, in, in instances where a behavioral intervention is just not practical. You can't possibly do the, th you know, timeout is great when you're at home, but when you're out at the store, that's harder to do. Or maybe this individual is big and it's hard to move them into timeout. And you can do it sometimes, but you can't do it all the time. And so prevention is really important for those times when the behavior can't really even be allowed to occur in the first place. Great example of prevention. You know, I had a, a girl that we worked with for a while who would get really aggressive. Um, she would attack her dad. Um, and, and what we showed was that the function of her behavior was to access preferred music, just loved music, loved gospel music. That was actually what she would listen to all the time. And so she would get aggressive anytime any music that wasn't gospel music came on, or if she was listening to gospel music and it got turned off or the battery on the, the, the CD player, this was a while ago, back in the days of CDs. Let me explain to some of you younger folks. CDs, there were these circle things that were kind of shiny. Anyway, you get the point, right? Um, but if she didn't have access to her music, she would get really aggressive. And so we had a good behavioral intervention where we were working with her on, you know, over time, her learning that aggression didn't act, produce access to preferred music. But one of the times that she would get aggressive, or one of the situations where she would get aggressive with her dad when she didn't have access to gospel music was when they were driving on the freeway and the radio station changed or, you know, the wrong song came on and she would be sitting in the back seat and she would attack her dad while he was driving at highway speeds. And if you live in Atlanta where I live, you know, we have I-85. I-85, sometimes people think that's the highway number, but many people here think that that's the minimum speed, right? So he'd be driving pretty fast and she'd get aggressive and grab him from behind and choke him with the seatbelt super dangerous situation. At one point he had to pull over and she got out of the car and was running across four lanes of traffic when these cars were doing 85 miles an hour. Super dangerous scenario. And so behavioral interventions, while they're important, and in some cases they may be the most important pat component of a good treatment package from the standpoint of long-term improvement, when you're driving at highway speed, that's not the time to just say, you know what, I need to wait her out, right? Like that's a super dangerous situation. You've got to have a preventative strategy so that you don't have that behavior occur in the first place. So that's when, when you first get in the car, you find some gospel music and you just put that sucker on loop and you play that, you know, repeat over and over and over again, even if you're losing your mind, listen to the same six songs, but it's safe so that you can get through your day so that you can work on the behavioral intervention in another scenario at another time. So I hope that that's clear that prevention is a really important piece that is sometimes overlooked. It is something that I think caregivers are pretty good at, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, behavior management, another piece that I think is sometimes overlooked, right? So again, if the focus is so is exclusively on behavioral interventions, that is again, the strategy or the approach that is important for long-term success in terms of seeing long-term reduction in problem behavior. 
But I'll tell you, I've been doing this for a long time. I've worked with a lot of individuals for a long time. And, and the best behavioral interventions sometimes only produce a moderate degree of improvement, right? I can think of, we had another young man who he would hit himself in the head and he would hit himself in the head about, you know, we have the data to show it in the video, he would hit himself in the head about 6,000 times a day, right? In a, in a six hour day uh, at our clinic, he would try to hit himself in the head 6,000 times. He'd actually blind himself in both eyes, give himself cataracts in both eyes, just through the, discon the, the constant blunt force trauma to the side of his head. Now, we had a behavioral intervention and we implemented that behavioral intervention. It was based on the function of his behavior, which we actually demonstrated that the function of his behavior is he would hit himself to get his mom to sit right next to him and hold his hand. Mom tried to stand up, he would start to hit himself. If she tried to cook a meal, he would start to hit himself. If she tried to use the bathroom, he would try to hit himself. She had to take her 12-year-old son into the bathroom with her in order to keep him from hitting himself in the head. Now we had a behavioral intervention and over time it was working pretty well. And we actually were able to achieve about a 97% reduction in his head banging, which is pretty good. 97%, that's an A, that's a high A, right? I'll take that in most instances. Um, but if you think about a 97% improvement, that means that we still continue to see about 180 blows to the head in that same time frame, and 180 blows to the head is too many. That's, I mean, how many blows to the head is too many? Well, one is probably too many, but 180 times hitting yourself in the head is way too many. And so even when we were able to see that kind of improvement with a behavioral intervention, we still needed to have a behavior management strategy. And in this instance, the behavior management strategy are those approaches that are going to decrease the effects of the behavior. It's basically an acknowledgement that you know, even with our best behavioral intervention in place, even giving it enough time to take effect, sometimes we need to just still address some lingering amount of problem behavior that's occurring, or in some instances, we can't implement the behavioral intervention, and we need to make sure that the behavior that's occurring, the problem behavior, isn't having a dramatic impact on that individual or on the people around them or on their, uh, on their overall outcome. So I, you think about this as examples of you know, sometimes you need to be able to work on your IEP goals while you're still developing the behavioral intervention. And so you need to have some management strategies in place that are going to just decrease the effects of that behavior on the individual and those around them. And then lastly, it's critical to have crisis management strategies as well, because you know what, again, I've been doing this too long to not recognize that even with everything in place, even when you're doing all the right things from an intervention standpoint, even when you're doing everything you can to prevent the behavior at certain times and places when you can't allow it to occur, even when you've got a good behavior management strategy in place, sometimes stuff just hits the fan. Sometimes you find yourself in a new situation or a new behavior occurs that you hadn't seen before, and you need to be ready for that with a crisis management strategy. So we think about where I work and in our program, we think about crisis management as basically just doing whatever is necessary to get that situation to end as quickly as possible because you're in a crisis. Somebody's under threat of real harm and you need the situation to get back under control as quickly as possible. Now, I'll talk about this more when I get to talk about crisis management a little bit more, but this oftentimes means doing the exact opposite of the behavioral intervention. If a behavioral intervention is never give in, wait them out, provide access to a preferred thing for a preferred for a better behavior, this might mean you just give them the thing he wants now to calm him down now, knowing that that actually might be a way of worsening behavior over the long term, but you just got to get the situation in hand as quickly as possible. So I'm going to talk, you know, the rest of my talk here today is going to be going through these four different uh, approaches. Um, I really wanted to just kind of define them for you quickly and give you a quick high level overview of what these are, and then spend a little bit more time talking specifics about, about each of these with a primary emphasis on intervention, because again, I think that's probably one of the more important pieces, um, but I do think that all four are really critical in order for a, a good treatment package to have the total success that folks are looking for, for people to be really a, uh, uh, equipped to address all aspects of problem behavior in all situations. So starting out talking about prevention. So as I said, prevention really is just trying to avoid the behavior occurring in the first place. And sometimes you just need to do that. Like I said, driving on the freeway at high speed, that is not the time to wait the kid out or to just deal with it or something along those lines. Now, I think about the young man who engaged in kind of um, disruptive stereotypy and, uh, and yelling whenever uh, he had loud noises, right? When he was around loud noises. Well, that's, that's a kid for whom we might have an intervention to, a de to deal with that, 
but sometimes you got to go to the school assembly for some weird reason and just give the kids some headphones, right, to block out the sound to prevent that behavior from occurring. That can be either because we're currently working on a behavioral intervention or because that's not the priority right now. And if I could give another piece of advice, it's really to try to prioritize things. I see in some instances families who try to, to do too many things at once and that leads to an inability to do any of those things particularly well. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that again later. Well, I, got, I feel like I got a lot of teasers here, right? I keep saying I'm gonna talk about that. But um, really, I think it's important to, to focus on one or two things and do them really well and try to make the maximal impact. Um, but that may mean that for other situations, you're not dealing with those right now. And that means maybe taking a preventative approach in those situations, right? So we're not working on going through it, getting through the assembly without a tantrum right now. It's more important for us to make sure that this child can sit in a desk, right? So that might mean that when we go to the assembly, we just, you know, ideally don't go to the assembly at all. That's a great preventative strategy. Just avoid the whole situation. But another one is, look, we have to, you know, some administrators got to, uh, bug somewhere and they're trying to force you to do something that you don't that this child maybe doesn't benefit a lot from we have to do it use the noise canceling headphones something along those lines right and so um a part of prevention again thinking about this from a functional standpoint if the behavior is occurring to escape from demands prevention in this case might just mean don't make demands right now right this is a time and a place where we don't make demands we'll save that for when we have the ability to to follow through on those demands when we have more control over the environment where it's safer what have you we'll do it then but hey look when we're driving on the freeway or whatever your equivalent is that may not be the time to be placing a lot of demands when the function of the behavior is to access preferred items just give the individual free access. That's putting the, DV, the CD player on loop, play gospel music continuously, right? Just to avoid the situation from occurring so that you can get to where you're going safely. Same thing with attention. There's other scenarios like that. So in the best case, you know, you're really restricting your prevention activities to those times and places where it's really just unsafe or unfeasible to implement something. So it's a good tool to have in your toolbox, but it's also something that you don't wanna rely on exclusively. And this slide really, I hope, gets to that point. You, it is possible to overly rely on prevention um, in a way that doesn't really advance quality of life in a, in a meaningful way. Um, and again, I find that a lot of families are really good at prevention because they've learned how to avoid a, a problem. That family who had you know, 11 different screens for that young man, they were avoiding a problem. They had gotten really good at just figuring out, look, let's just keep him swimming in screens and we won't have problems. The issue is when batteries die or screens break or what have you, that's where things really got to be difficult for that family. And so these are my terms. This is not something from the literature. This is just kind of my own um, thinking around how to, to kind of think about prevention as existing along a continuum. And so on one end of the continuum, I have some caregivers who take an approach that I would call more, I don't know, accommodation, right? And so these are the families who are thinking about their child from the standpoint of, you know what, my child has some, some real strengths, but also some areas where there's some struggles. I want my kid to be happy in life. And so I'm going to do my best to avoid situations where those struggles become a challenge for them. And I want them to be happy, right? And so I think about there was a family that I had that I worked with a while back who their daughter really loved slushies. And anytime they tried to drive past a convenience market where she knew that there was a slushie machine, she would flip out. And so they went and they had some, the means to do it. So they went out and bought a slushy machine and they had it in their house and she could get slushies whenever she wanted. And so that family, I would say, is kind of taking this accommodation approach. Our daughter has some, some areas where she struggles and she really likes slushies and we want her to be happy. So we're going to buy a slushy machine because we can afford to do it. Okay. Right. Nothing that I'm not saying that's a wrong approach. That's just one approach. Right. At the other end of this continuum, I see families who take a different approach where they think, well, you know what, same, same story. Our child has some strengths, but also some areas where they're really challenged. We want our kid to be as fully integrated into society as they can be, knowing that that may not be the same as for lots of typically developing kids, but as much as possible. And so that means we're going to work on some things and we're going to push a little bit. And that means that the child might not always be as happy all the time. So when you think about these two approaches, like I say, in the accommodation end of the continuum, that might mean avoiding problem behavior. Whereas on the integration side of the continuum, that might mean working through some problem behavior and potentially with some fireworks, right? Things can get tough when you do that from time to time. It also might mean that on the accommodation side of things, that child might generally be pretty happy. You know, I would be really happy to have slushy machines in my house. I like slushies as much as the next guy. That'd be great. 
until the slushy machine breaks or you know they're not able to get that for some reason or another and so then you might see real big problems whereas on the integration side of things that child might be pretty upset because you're working through challenges and you're trying to teach new skills in ways that to, to adapt and and to kind of integrate as much as possible now i want to really highlight the fact that this continuum it's not it's not a categorical thing right most families are somewhere in the middle some families kind of skew a little bit one way or the other um, and again, I think that families have a right to make these decisions. I'm not here to say one thing is right or wrong. That's an ethical question. And that's not my, I'm not an ethicist. I'm not your priest, right? I'm someone who's here trying to think about how to help families achieve their goals. And so where I see problems sometimes, it's not necessarily that families want to do one thing or the other. The problem sometimes arises when they want one outcome, but they want to do the other thing, right? So families who want their child to be as integrated as possible, without ever having to deal with challenges by keeping their kid happy all the time, right? And so that's where I sometimes see a mismatch between what the families are willing to do and the outcome that they want. And that's where I feel like sometimes it's my responsibility to kind of say, look, I understand you want your kid to be fully integrated as much as possible into society and to have as many skills as possible. I want you to, and I'm happy to work with you on that, but you need to understand that means sometimes that child's gonna be upset. That means sometimes you're gonna to have to work through some real challenges. So let's find the place along this continuum that feel, feels right for you. And that might mean, well, we're a little bit towards the integration side, but we're not fully there, right? Or maybe we're a little bit to the accommodation side. We're, we're gonna to try to work on some skills, but for the most part, we're gonna not push too hard. That's okay. But it's important to be really clear where you fall on this continuum, because if you rely on prevention to an extreme, that's getting to that accommodation side. And, and it means it's good to have prevention tools in your toolbox, but you don't want to rely on them exclusively, or you're really not able to achieve as much from an integration standpoint. So I hope that's clear. All right. Moving on, and I said I wanted to focus as much as possible on the behavioral interventions part because this is the section that I think is real or the, the, the approach that is going to generally produce the longest lasting and the most substantial improvements, right? So again, I think that these behavioral interventions is important to know that they can be effortful, that they can be involved. Things like functional communication training involves teaching replacement behaviors, demand fading, all this kind of stuff. Oftentimes, these are implemented by people with some specific training like VCBAs, and you've heard me bring them up a handful of times now. That's my background. Those are the types of folks that I train. Sometimes these even have to happen in specialized settings for kids who are really engaging in dangerous problem behavior or those behaviors that are putting them at significant risk or their caregivers at significant risk. Oftentimes for us, those kids have to be in the Atlanta area and we have to see them every day for a long period of time in a setting that I described earlier that really has a lot of resources in order to do things safely and still produce good outcomes. I think it's important to point out that, as I mentioned earlier, the BCBA overall is a relatively new credential, right? It's really only been around since the early 2000s. So that's a pretty new discipline when you think about things like, you know, psychology has been a discipline since for 100 years or so, right? Um, and so in those 20 years that this has been around, there really has been a lot of development. Um, and yet it's also important to note that the discipline is not as far as others might be and as far as others might want it to be, which means that there's, there's lots of variability, right? That, that depending on who you get as your provider, somebody might have a ton of experience of working with challenging behavior and other folks may have very little experience dealing with challenging behavior. And so it's important to really um, understand what their relative strengths are, where they've got some experience and maybe some areas where they are not as strong so that if you're working with someone, you know what they're best equipped to help you with. Um, so I just think that, again, again, these are my people. These are the folks that I train. These are the people I work with. This is kind of a professional identity for me. And yet even I can acknowledge there's a lot of variability in the degree of um, uh, experience and training for some of these folks, especially when it comes to problem behavior. You know, the vast majority of BCBAs out there are getting lots of experience working with kids on skill acquisition and less on challenge behavior. And that's where I said, again, asking questions like, have you ever done a functional analysis can give you some good insights, whether you need a functional analysis or not. You may not need one for your kid, but if they haven't ever done one, that might tell you that they haven't got as much experience as someone who has. Um, all right. So when it comes to these behavioral interventions, in general, they tend to oftentimes follow a format that I think it's really important to recognize. And that is oftentimes it's important to take a step back in order to be able to take two steps forward. Um, I think it's important to emphasize this because sometimes I've worked with folks in the past who really want things to improve, but they want things to, to not change while things are improving. And that isn't always feasible. 
a good example of that, I worked with a teacher one time. There was a kid in this classroom who um, had some pretty significant intellectual disabilities, um, engaged in lots of problem behavior. And I walked into the classroom and I saw this kid and it's one of those, you knew right away which kid you were look, they were looking for help with, right? Because he was running around the classroom, ripping papers off other people's desks, tearing them apart. So I talked to the teacher and I said, all right, what is this kid supposed to be doing? Well, he's supposed to be sitting in his desk doing seat work on worksheets by himself. Okay, right? Whether that was the best thing for that kid to be doing or not, different conversation, but all right, let's buy, get, try to get some buy-in with this teacher. Let's focus on that. How long is he supposed to be sitting in his chair? Well, he should be there for 15 minutes, be able to work on his own. Okay, so we started by taking some big steps back. We said, all right, we're just gonna start with sitting in the chair. And so we worked with him and if he, if it was literally at the point where, you know, rear end makes physical contact with seat and he got a preferred item, right? He is able to access a preferred toy for 30 seconds. And so he was, and I think it was an iPad for him too. Lots of kids like iPads, but touches seat, iPad goes in his hands pretty quickly. This kid was sitting down repeatedly all the time. All right, great. We've made some advancement. Now we need to actually have him stay in the seat for a little while. So basically over time, gradually increasing the amount of time that he stayed in the seat, he would access that iPad. And then we said, all right, well, you're, you're staying in the seat, sitting at the desk. Great. Now let's put a worksheet in front of him. He didn't have to do anything. He just had to not rip it. And then it was, all right, you know, actually pick up the pencil. And then it was do a little bit of the work on the worksheet. And we eventually got to the point where he's sitting in his desk for 10 minutes working on task, looking great. We go to the teacher and we said, hey, look, isn't this impressive? Sitting for 10 minutes working. And she said, well, he's supposed to do 15, right? You know, she was very unhappy and dissatisfied with what we'd done because she really was not interested in taking a step back. It had to be 15 from the very get go or it wasn't valuable to her. And I think, but at the same time, we were able to get 10 good minutes out of that kid instead of 15 terrible minutes, which is where things were when we started. And it was only possible by taking some big steps backwards. And so that, again, I think is important to set reasonable expectations that while working on challenging behaviors like this, it may be important to adjust your expectations about what's gonna be accomplished so that you can focus specifically on problem behavior. That might mean that we're not achieving as much in terms of academics or um, other skills. That might mean that for a little while, we're giving the kids something really preferred all the time in order to get some momentum. Um, and so that's an important uh, acknowledgement that folks need to make in order to be able to see some success so that you can move beyond where you even were before. Um, so again, one step back to two steps forward. Another thing that's important to really assess is how hard is this gonna be, right? And caregivers have different thresholds when it comes to how much time can they dedicate to addressing problem here. How much energy do you have? I mean, I'm a parent of four kids. I got three teenagers and a nine-year-old, right? I got 19, 17, and 16 right now, and nine. And so I tell parents, tell, tell friends, you know, my wife and I have the worst of both worlds. We have four kids and an only child. And that nine-year-old is getting a very different experience from his siblings because my energy level for a nine-year-old right now is not what it was when my 19-year-old was nine, when we would do lots of things. And so my nine-year-old is very fond of telling me, dad, you're old. And he's right. He is not wrong about that. And I tell him it's because your siblings sucked all the life out of me. Um, and so, but it's a reality. Not everybody has the same level of energy to deal with these things. And so it's something to acknowledge up front. Physical strength is a big one, right? I've got lots of kids who are bigger than their parents. And when they're bigger than their parents, that just takes a lot of options off the table. You're not going to physically sit this kid in time out when he's bigger than you, or even when he's half your size. People don't recognize, and when I talk to people who don't have kids with developmental issues or with problem behavior, they have no idea. And they say, well, how bad, you know, they'll, they'll see my clinic and they'll see a little kid walking in, maybe a five-year-old walking into clinic. And they say, what's that kid doing here? How bad can a five-year-old be? I look them dead in the eyes and they say, you know what, how, how tall is that five-year-old? What, four feet tall, three and a half, right? If you're in the woods at night and a three and a half foot tall animal attacks you, you run like crazy because that's the size of a bobcat. A bobcat will tear you up. And for a lot of these individuals, when they are going at it full on and they have no restraint at all, that's a really dangerous situation. So physical strength is a real consideration that has to be taken seriously. And then the last category, I don't have a better name for it than just emotional fortitude, right? How much do you really, can you really put into this before you lose your mind? Um, and that's a reality. Again, you know, are you going to lose your mind? Are you going to break down, especially in this time with COVID where everybody is stressed out and everybody's having to readjust and examine their priorities? You know, it's just not in the cards for everybody to do all the things all the time. 
And so that might mean scaling back on what you're going to try to address and targeting something small that you can see some success as opposed to trying to address all the problems at once. You know, I had a, a colleague who one time said, is the juice going to be worth the squeeze, right? And I'm not sure exactly he was referring to the same kind of scenario, but I think that the, the expression is apt in this case because are you going to have the payoff that's worth everything you're going to put into it? Because it may be that there's a lot that has to go into making a relatively small change. And sometimes small changes are big wins. Don't get me wrong. But I mean, I, there was a family that we worked with where we spent a, a year or more trying to get behavior under control. And when they said, my, when I got an email from them, they said, we went on a date and we were able to leave our kid at home for an hour and a half. Like for, for so many families, that doesn't feel like a big win, but for a lot of the families that I work with, that was massive, right? So knowing what the outcome is gonna be as much as possible in advance really can help you to um, prioritize and, and uh, allocate resources accordingly, including these. So the other thing to keep in mind is what's gonna work and what's possible to implement. Sometimes there's a ton of overlap between those things, but other times, you know what? The things that will work and the things that you can do may only overlap a tiny bit. And sometimes it's important to acknowledge when this is the scenario, that really there is nothing that is going to work that you can actually implement. And that means reprioritizing of those four different approaches. Look, behavioral intervention is not in the cards for that individual. We're going to have to rely on behavior management, prevention, and crisis management. And that's just a reality. And again, it's a reality that's important to recognize when that's the case. So common components of behavioral interventions. The first is extinction. This is a term that just refers to disrupting the relationship between the problem behavior and the functional reinforcer. Think about my friend who attacks her dad while they're driving at highway speed. The functional reinforcer in that scenario is access to preferred music. Um, and extinction in this case is just making sure that anytime she becomes aggressive, she doesn't get the, the preferred music, right? So in some cases that just might mean She's aggressive and problem behavior doesn't produce that. In other cases, it might mean we turn off all music, right? Um, so extinction is just disrupting that relationship between those two things. Again, this isn't possible to do in every scenario and you definitely don't wanna do it when you're driving on the freeway, but it does mean that it's important to have some control over that and try to restrict it when the problem behavior occurs. But now that will work to an extent. It will work a lot better for individuals when there's some other means of accessing the same functional reinforcement, right? So in that case, for that young woman, just making sure that anytime she was aggressive, she never got access to, to gospel music, that would work, but it would take a really long time. It worked a lot faster once we taught her to ask appropriately for gospel music. Right. So we, in her case, she didn't have any vocal communication. We actually developed a, we used a picture communication system for her to actually hand over a thing that, that asked for gospel music. And whenever she did, she got the music. And so she was able to access that. And she learned pretty quickly, Hey, this gets me what my want, what I want. Problem behavior never gets me what I want. So I'm going to do the picture exchange all the time. And that worked really well. We stopped seeing problem behavior pretty quickly. That'll get you up to a certain point, but it's also important to increase social validity, right? Asking for gospel music continuously is also just not in the cards. So I'm going to talk you through a little bit of another example of how we went about doing this in one case. So remember that functional analysis I showed you earlier, that young man, man who was aggressive about twice a minute for iPads. These are the same data for that same young man. And so this is a baseline situation where very similar situation to the functional analysis. If he was aggressive, someone would say, oh, never mind, here, take your iPad. And they would give it to him for 30 seconds. And then they'd say, no, nope, never mind, I need to take it back. And if he was aggressive again, they'd get it back. So just kind of that situation that could often occur in a real world scenario, but in an analog context. And you can see, again, we're seeing pretty high rates of aggressive behavior in this instance, up to around five a minute. Now, for him, we then went to what we call functional communication training, where he never was able to access the iPad by being aggressive. If he hit, he didn't get the iPad. The therapist just waited him out, wouldn't give in to him. Um, again, this is a therapist who's trained to deal with aggressive behavior with protective equipment if that's what she needed, but made sure that he never got the iPad when he was aggressive. And you can see that after an initial spike, it went away. Now, we usually want to make sure that we're not just getting a good day, right? So we, you know, we see this reduction just because it's Tuesday and Tuesday was pizza day and you like pizza. So we actually went back to that baseline situation and so sure enough, the problem behavior came back and then we went back to the FCT, problem behavior went away. This is telling us that we can turn it on and off. That's a good sign. But remember what I said about communication being important too. This bottom panel represents requests. And again, initially he didn't request at all because he didn't have any effective means of communication in his repertoire. But during that FCT, we taught him a card exchange that said, iPad please. 
he would exchange a card that said iPad. And every time he exchanged the card, you can see on the bottom panel, he started to use that more and more. And that was correlated with the reduction in problem behavior that we see in the same phase in the top panel. When we went back to baseline, he stopped asking and problem behavior came back. And then we went back to treatment. Again, it was working pretty well. So this is that scenario I'm talking about. Extinction combined with reinforcing an alternative behavior with the functional, uh, with the functional reinforcer, iPad in this case. Now, that worked really, really well, except he's still asking for his iPad every 30 seconds, twice a minute, right? If you look at that bottom, bottom right corner. And that's just not realistic for most people. And so that's where I said increasing the social validity can be really important. Whoops, did I skip some graphs? Oh, we're missing some data, all right? Or some data that I was hoping to show. So let me just say what we did next. So in, the, in his example, we, we started to try to bring the, the exchange of the card under the control of some stimuli in, in the environment. We essentially wanted to teach him, sometimes you can ask for your iPad and you get it, and sometimes you don't. And so we had two little colored cards. One was green, green means go, red, red for stop. And so when the card was green, if he asked for the, and we kind of hung it on the wall, the therapist would hold, wear it around her neck. Um, so it was very visible that we were under a green scenario versus a red scenario. When it was green, if he requested his iPad, he got it right away. When it was red, if he asked for his iPad, he didn't get it. Now, initially, this was very skewed towards green. So we were doing 45 seconds of green for 15 seconds of red. So he could ask more of the time it was available than not. And then 15 seconds, if he asked, he didn't get it, but he still didn't get it if he engaged in problem behavior. And when we first started, we did see some kind of recurrence of problem behavior under the red scenario, but then eventually went away. And once that happened, we were getting, he was reliably requesting the iPad when it was green. He was reliably not requesting or engaging in problem behavior in red. Still 45 seconds to 15. That's not a very manageable schedule. But over time, we would gradually increase the amount of time he spent in red. So we eventually got to the point where he was in 15 minutes of red for every 15, for 45 seconds of green. That was a scenario that the family could live with, that they could say, look, you know, for, 50, for 15 minutes, that gives me time to go use the restroom and he doesn't have the iPad. That gives me the chance to go do a task or work on IEP goals with him in the classroom so that he can just have 45 seconds of, of iPad. And, and also 15 minutes was a start. We didn't stop there, we continued on. But over time, we were able to get a point where he was managing that pretty well. Didn't use problem behavior. He learned that eventually it'll be my turn to ask for my stuff. It's not gone forever. And when I have access, I can request it and gain access to it without engaging in problem behavior. So that's an example of how we try to make these treatments more socially valid. There are some things to keep in mind whenever using extinction. One is that new behaviors can sometimes occur. Um, that means new problem behaviors sometimes occur. And also that the behavior sometimes gets worse before it gets better. That's this extinction burst terminology that you see right here. Another thing that can happen is that there's the possible, and, and that just means be ready for it, right? I sometimes think about the example of, you know, the parent who tells themselves, well, Dr. Call told me that I need to outlast him when he throws this tantrum. Time to go outside. We need to go run an errand, get your shoes on. Kid throws a tantrum. All right, well, Dr. Call said outlast him. So, nope, we're not, you know, you got to go outside and, you know, we're not giving you the thing you want. You got to get the shoes on. And then 45 minutes later, parents lost their mind. They're totally tired and exhausted. Kids still throwing the tantrum. And the parent just says, forget it. I'm just get, you know, let's just go. And they put the shoes on for the kid instead of making them do it. And they just go. What does the kid learn in that situation? From the kid's perspective, I got a tantrum at least 45 minutes before someone will do this for me, right? So the next time around, don't wait, don't, don't quit for at least 50 minutes, right? Because there was that one time, 45 minutes, and then they gave up. So this is that example of an intermittent schedule, um, this possibility that you can actually make things worse by not working through, being prepared for an extinction burst and working through it. All right, some other pitfalls that can occur when trying to deal with uh, reinforcing alternative behaviors, right? That's that, you know, if the kid asks for the iPad, you give it to him. One is to not use the functional reinforcer whenever possible. So again, the functional reinforcer, it's important to use that if you can. So if the behavior is occurring to access gospel music, then try to teach a replacement behavior that accesses gospel music, not something random like a fruit snack, right? Fruit snacks might be great, but we're trying to replace problem behavior that's occurring to get gospel music. It's gonna be more effective if it achieves the same outcome for the individual. It's also important to use reinforcers that are not um, frequently available other times, right? You wanna avoid that whenever possible. Um, one example of this I can think of is we had a young man that we were working with. We were trying to teach him some academic skills and we asked the parent, what are some things that he really likes that he might work for? Parents said he loves video games. All right, well, that's cool. 
we have some video game system here we can have them work for. So set it up so that if he did a little bit of work, he'd get access to some video games and it just wasn't working. I mean, we, he would just, he would rather sit there like a bump all day long rather than do even a tiny bit of work to get access to these video games. And we're like, well, that seems weird. Parents swear up and down. That's all he likes to do. Went back to them and said, you know, are you sure? Yep. Video games. That's the thing. Tried again. Wasn't working. Dug a little bit deeper. Turns out that he had every video game system known to man and pretty much continuous access known pretty much continuous access at home. So he had the game X cube system station, whatever. Meanwhile, we had the rinky dink Nintendo 64, you know, the kind of do, 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 you know, not the same thing. And so he had free access at home. There was no reason for him to work for something that wasn't as good and was, a, and that required work to access it at, at our center. So using things that might not otherwise be available will make them more valuable to the individual and more effective. At the same time, it's important to make sure that you're using them consistently and frequently. Also, it's oftentimes a mistake to not give more reinforcement uh, or to give reinforcement immediately after the behavior that you want to see occurs. So I think about the example of, you know, I, I went into a classroom and I asked the teacher, you know, this kid's not doing the work that I need him to do or he's not gaining the skill. Well, are you using any kind of reinforcement? Sure. What are you using? Goldfish. Great. Well, it turns out this kid had been working for goldfish for months and had never once earned one. And so he eventually just through happenstance did the thing that the teacher wanted him to do. She wasn't prepared. She said, good job and jumped up and had to run across the room and rummage through the, the closet to find the goldfish and run back. And it took about a minute and a half. And by the time she got there, this kid had kicked his neighbor and, you know, picked his nose and done 10 other things. So when she gives him the goldfish, what's being reinforced? All that other stuff, not necessarily the performance that she was trying to reinforce. So it's important that it occur immediately, especially early on. Um, also, it's a mistake to offer the to not offer the reinforcer, or sorry, to offer the reinforcer when a child's non-compliant or disruptive. I think about this as you know, I see this a lot, kind of when I'm out in the community, and I, you know, I go to the store and I see that parent who's struggling with their child, and I empathize and I feel for that parent, but you know, the kids climbing out of the shopping cart and grabbing things off the shelf and doing all the stuff. And the mom finally says, you know what, look, if you're good, we'll go to, we can go to make here, have this thing, just calm down. Right. And they give the kid the preferred thing. Um, now that kid was doing all the wrong stuff and the parent didn't attempt to calm them down. Basically it was using a crisis management strategy, right? They're giving the kid the thing up front to calm them down, but what is being reinforced is all the problem behavior, right? It's fine if you're in a crisis, but if you're not, this is a mistake that can make things worse and not better. All right, moving through these. All right. Oh, this is the graph that I was trying to show you. I don't know how these things got out of order, but this is the young man where we kind of introduced the two, the green card and the red card. And you can see we got to, nine, to 900 seconds or 15 minutes. All right. Again, with behavioral intervention, some things that are really important, these do require consistency, time, and flexibility in order to do these things consistently or be able to do these things in a way that's effective. Um, and the best way to approach this, I find, is to, to be systematic about it and not necessarily just try to do them off the cuff. And that means, again, identifying some specific targets that you want to work on, specific times you want to work on them, and treat it just like anything else, right? You know, we're working on skills with kids on, in academic settings. We, we set aside math time to work on math because that's a skill we need to work on. Problem behavior, oftentimes think of it in the same way. It's a skill. We need to work on it. We need to program time. We need to be systematic about it. It's no different than working on academic skills. Now, at the same time, there are some ways to really set yourself up for success or failure, depending on which approach you take. When it comes, and so I think about this as practice sessions, setting up actual sessions where you're going to work on challenging behavior. Give yourself an opportunity to work on these, ideally when the situation is a little low pressure, where you can actually plan ahead, be systematic be consistent. Sometimes if you're going out of the community, you might need to leave suddenly or end the experience pretty quickly and you don't want to set yourself up for failure there. You want to control as much as you can about the situation. You want to be able to follow through, as I said, be consistent and always end on a good note. So this is basically the opposite. This is times when you should not implement some kind of new strategy. Things like, hey, we're going to work on going to the store because when every time I go to the store, my kid throws a tantrum. Well, maybe don't wait until the house has no food in the pantry to go to the store. That's a particularly difficult thing now because a lot of us are shopping a lot less often, right? But, you know, hey, we got to go to the store. And if the kid throws a tantrum, you know, you know, we don't have any bread or milk or eggs or anything. You're going to spend the time there. So maybe 
set up a time to be more successful. Same thing. You want to work on, you know what, my, my kid gets really upset every time I talk on the phone. I actually had a kid that I worked with where he would get to tantrum. Every time mom talked to her friend Peaches, the friend's name was Peaches. I know that I'll never forget that. So anytime she talked to Peaches, this kid would throw a tantrum. And it's not like she said, hey, Peaches. Sometimes she did, sometimes she didn't. She must have used a different tone of voice or something, but he would throw a great big tantrum, probably because he learned that she was going to be on the phone for a while. So waiting until you need to talk to Peaches about something really critical is not the time to work on this, right? Instead, maybe pick a time when it's a little more possible. A lot of families tell me they want to be able to work on going out to a meal together because going out to restaurants is difficult. Well, don't wait until it's like, you know, mama and papa's 50th anniversary or it's somebody's birthday. Choose a time that's a little more convenient. Or you're in a rush to get out the door for school. If you want to work on that routine, don't wait until you're already late to work on that. Instead, think about maybe work on going to the store when you don't have to buy anything so that you can leave suddenly if things are going well or if things go badly and you just need to cut your losses. Same thing with, you know, maybe make arrangements with peaches in advance and say, look, hey, call me in a half hour and we're only going to talk for a few minutes. And it's only so that you can work on that skill with your kid as opposed to have some important conversation. When it's time to go out to meet, you want to work on going out to meals, do it at a time when it's actually you can work, focus specifically on that. And I'll use that as an example in a minute. Or when you're not in a hurry to go anywhere, you got some spare time. Now's the time to practice going through your routine of getting out the door. So practice sessions is important to stay realistic, limit problematic factors that aren't crucial, um, follow through on using the behavior management strategy. Again, use a function-based strategy. Always have an exit plan. Be, be able to end it on, an, uh, on your terms when you need to, but if possible, end on a good note and don't push your luck. Let me give you an example of what I mean, using going out to eat as an example. Define success ahead of time. What does success look like for going out to a meal? Does that mean that we get through the whole thing and he didn't flip the table over? Great. That's what we're going to focus on. If it means, look, you know what? We're not embarrassed by anything that happened. That's different. So that might mean that you have to define that very specifically. I would suggest in this example, and this is one I've used with my own son who has you know, autism, go early, like four o'clock in the afternoon when there's nobody else there and nobody waiting. So you're not sitting in line. I, we took our kid to a Mexican and Italian restaurant where there's food sitting on the table when we sat down. There's chips and salsa or there's bread. We're not sitting and waiting. We told our server what we were doing. We said, here's our credit card. We might have to leave suddenly. So have it ready to run so that we don't have to wait on that part of the experience. We only worked on the really tough stuff. You know what, if he was whining or even if he screamed a little bit, not as big of a deal. But we were working specifically on keeping his shoes on, staying in the chair, right? Like those were the things we wanted to focus on. If less important problem behavior that we weren't focusing on occurred, maybe he took the crayons that came with the, the coloring placemat and drew on something he wasn't supposed to. Let's just kind of block it and move through it. That wasn't as big of a deal. We stuck to our rules. We said if problem behavior occurred, we were going to you know, have a consequence and we followed through with that. And then we used that function-based strategy and also made sure that we ended successfully, right? There's a temptation to push your luck. Man, isn't he, do I remember, that, isn't he doing great? We never thought we'd make it through appetizers, much less a whole meal. Let's order dessert, right? What happens every time? Well, you order dessert and then crap hits the fan and now you're dealing with a problem. So don't push your luck. Keep, your, keep it a small scale success and work up gradually to, to the bigger experience, right? So that's just one example of using these practice sessions to have success. I talked a little bit about behavior management strategies. I'm going to spend a little bit less time on this in crisis management, but again, it's important to really um, reduce the effects of the, to try to reduce the effects of the behavior by prioritizing safety above all. And then after that, to your ability to make progress in other areas, um, and then it may be important to still focus on quality of life, but last and least important would be things that are just convenient. And so what I mean by this would be things that you can do to, again, mitigate the effects of the behavior. One example is elopement. We work a lot with kids who elope here. And so even when we have that 97% success treatment, elopement might still occur. And elopement's one of those behaviors that can be really life-threatening. You got a kid who runs into traffic or runs out of a store and gets lost and so, or runs out of the house. And so all of those things, because of the seriousness of it, even when a good behavioral intervention is in place that's really having a good effect, 
it can still be really important to have some management strategies to reduce the impact should the behavior occur. So for example, we work with families to make sure they have a plan, that that plan includes how they're gonna contact uh, emergency responders. There's a phone, they keep the phone numbers with them for the, in the Amber Alert, which in Georgia is the way you act to activate a missing persons report. Um, that they've contacted their neighbors so that their neighbors have met their child and know what their child looks like. So that if they see their child wandering with no one else around, it's okay, please stop, call us, here's our number. Be able to be part of, you know, for those neighbors who are willing, would you be willing to serve as a member of a search party if our kid goes missing? Can we call you to help us look for him? Um, teaching key safety skills to that child so that if they do get lost, they can tell people their name and address. Um, so in some cases, even using technology for tracking or identify, identification. So those are all examples of management strategies. This is, the behavior occurs, how do you make sure that the, the potentially worst case scenario doesn't ensue? And there are other strategies that can be used for management. This is an example of some of the protective equipment that our staff sometimes wear. So we know the behavior is gonna occur, especially when a behavioral intervention is in its early phases. So how do we make sure that nobody gets hurt? Well, it can be through protective equipment like this. Here's another example of some of the protective equipment that's less obtrusive. On the right there, you can see me modeling some of our arm guards, right? That's me there. I, you can't see me right now, but I really do look that good. Um, and these are examples of things that we worked with the hospital that we work with, where we're part of a children's healthcare system. And the nurses in the hospital who would see kids come into the ED would see kids with disabilities and autism and might really have problem behavior that would occur, bites, hits, and kicks. And they would, they would kind of react very strongly. They, they're not used to that. They would act scared or hesitant, which would actually make the situation worse. And by giving them access to some of this protective equipment that they can wear under long sleeves of a shirt that they're wearing already and can be unobtrusive, they were able to work with kids and not be scared or hesitant and thereby um, these kids would react a little bit, be le a little bit less reactive and they could get more done. So examples of how things like protective equipment can be a behavior management strategy that can then allow you to, to continue to work on other things that need to be or get things done that need to be done. Finally, crisis management strategies. And again, as I said, this is something that shouldn't be, it should be part of any good plan for dealing with challenging behavior. And as I said earlier on, this really is just doing whatever it takes to end a crisis as quickly as possible. Now, these generally are what we would consider to be counter therapeutic. This is doing the wrong thing for the right reasons, right? This is giving the kid the iPad to calm them down because they're about to do something really dangerous. You know, one example I think of is we had a, a gentleman that we were working with. He's a pretty big guy, 300 pounder, right? And he would get pretty aggressive and we worked with him long enough and he'd, he'd had some success. And we essentially set up a scenario where if he performed at a certain level, he was able to go to the store and pick out a treat. I mean, oftentimes picked out a candy bar. So we parked the car and we were driving, we were walking into the store and he dropped to the ground right in front of the store in the street. Um, now, Cars are driving by and you know, this is a super dangerous situation because he's low to the ground, people don't see him. This is not the time necessarily to implement extinction and outlast him. This is when I say to my colleague, run inside, get a Snickers bar, stand on the sidewalk and wave it in front of him because we need to get this guy moving. He's 300 pounds, I can't lift him. So we did the wrong thing. We gave him a Snickers bar, which what is that reinforcing? Dropping to the ground. But we needed to get the situation safe quickly because it was just so dangerous and we didn't have an alternative. But that also means we should only consider that crisis a crisis the first time it happened. Once he did that once, we know that this is a club in his bag. This is a tool in his toolbox. This is a, something in his arsenal. We know now that he'll drop to the ground sometimes. We didn't know that before. And so that meant we don't go to the store again until we have a plan for how we're going to handle that if he drops to the ground to get him safely moving again without having to reinforce the bad behavior that we're trying to eliminate, right? So that meant that we move away from that, what we call de-escalation by having an alternative strategy in place. Really quickly, because I know I want to leave some time for questions, when it comes to responding to crisis situations, first step is to really assess and stabilize the situation. That might mean finding out, do we have the right number of people in the room? Sometimes that means adding people because it's unsafe to be in a room by yourself. Sometimes it's, you know, but more is not always better. Adding people to the room sometimes just escalates the situation because now the person's more upset, they're scared, that things are weird, and so they might actually escalate themselves. Identifying the cause of that problem behavior, really quickly figuring out, sometimes it's really clear, other times it's not, but if possible, just eliminate whatever that cause is. In the case of that gentleman, I don't know why he dropped to the ground. Maybe it was just too far, I'm not sure. So we had to find something else. We couldn't find the functional reinforcer. We just said, get the candy bar, because we know he likes that and that might get him moving. We know it's highly motivating for him. 
In some cases, it means containment in, certain, in terms of a certain space, keeping the individual there to keep them safe. But the most important part of this is that post-crisis. This is the kind of thing that, I, especially when we, and we have a whole um, curriculum where we train providers in crisis management so that they can manage the individual safely, minimize any use of things like restraint, um, but also stay safe. And the number one thing we train them to do is to focus on this post-crisis um, uh, debriefing to understand why did how did we get to where we are what are we going to do to make it different next time so that we don't end up in a crisis again and that's because I can't tell you the number of times I go into a school or a classroom as an example or a center that's working with folks with disabilities and they say oh look Bob's in crisis again okay let's all go use our restraint techniques or whatever and it's the 50th crisis I'm, you can't see me I'm using air quotes here it's the 50th time this crisis has occurred in the last six months somebody should have found a better way to deal with that so that it didn't escalate to that point of crisis again. It's not from my, from our definition that we use where I work and in the system that we've developed, it stops being a crisis after the first time you get to call it a crisis once after that, you got to have a strategy, a plan so that you can deal with it without having to go into a crisis management mode. All right. I just feel strongly about that part. All right. So, Lastly, just a few take home points before we end and again have a few minutes for questions. Number one, whoops. Number one, again, prob behavior is orderly. I, I can't tell you the number of times I talk to families and we say, well, we'll try to identify what the function of the behavior is. And people say, it's just random, right? And it feels random. Remember me going to the store with my kid, you know, the tantrum that occurred that never occurred before feels very random when I can't isolate the specific cause for that kid on that day. But there's so much research and so much evidence that these behaviors are almost always orderly. It's just a matter of identifying the function. And that function is really key. That function is basically understanding the cause of the behavior from the perspective of that individual. And that is really crucial to understanding what consequences to use in your behavioral interventions and strategies to address the problem behavior. Caregiver behavior generally has to change in order to change the, the individual's behavior. And that's, again, just something that is can be difficult. It means doing some really good self-assessment to understand what does that mean for you? What are you capable of changing? What are you not capable of changing? What do your circumstances allow for? And the recognition of what can you do and what can't you do? And then making those changes is hard, so plan ahead. Be prepared to take a step back. Be prepared to work through some challenging times, um, but being thoughtful and planful and addressing it in a systematic way is really the only way to have lasting long-term improvement. So with that, that's everything that I have for you today. Thanks so much for your attention. Um, I was asked to keep a few minutes for questions and by my clock, I show that we have about eight minutes for questions. I don't know if Ronnie, if you wanna jump in here, if you've been monitoring the, the Q&A or if there's any other way to get at questions that I can help with. Sure, hi. Um, so the first question that we had, um, maybe I think best would be to try to run through some possible causes uh, is I have a two and a half year old little girl who is constantly crying. She also has a speech delay. What can I do? Yeah. So one of the things I should, I should give a caveat before I get into anything else. And that is to say that, you know, drive by, you know, uh, quick consults without really <laughs> meeting the individual is, is, actually considered unethical, right? That it's not appropriate to give people a ton of advice without knowing the specifics of the individual. At the same time, I'd like to try to speak in some generalities. And so take it for what it's worth, which may not be a lot, but I can give some ideas to think about. So when you think about a speech delay in particular, frequently um, the, the first thing to do is to understand the function of that kid's behavior. And when there's a speech delay involved, that oftentimes is correlated with problem behavior. When a child can't communicate what they want, what their needs are, when they're uncomfortable, what they don't like about what's going on, those are the kinds of things that can be really crucial for understanding the purpose of the behavior for that individual. And so what I would probably want to start with is understand, are there specific scenarios that seem to produce crying more than others, right? Is it, is it occurring more specifically um, like going through that list of questions I had earlier, is it happening in sometimes in some situations? Is it never happening in sometimes of situations? Is there a scenario where it never occurs? Again, this is where it can oftentimes feel very random, but with the right assessment strategy, we can generally find an orderliness to it. It may not be possible for a caregiver to do that on their own. It may require some expertise and getting a little bit of help from someone who has training to do functional analysis or at least some form of functional assessment 
is a subcategory, right? That it can actually, or a broader category that includes a wider range of assessments to identify the function for that particular uh, little girl. And then from there, the fact again, that there's communication problems tells me that teaching some appropriate alternative communicative strategies for that, that girl may be really the key for reducing the crying all the time. But it also means picking which, which, uh, which communicative phrases or statements or requests, usually we start with requests, right? Because requests have the most impact for her. You know, as parents, we all want to hear mama. We all want to hear I love you. But from her perspective, it might be candy, right? Like I sometimes tell folks, I, I can teach candy pretty easily because it produces candy. You know, candy is something that kids really like. And that's something that you might be able to teach. And it may not be vocal speech. It might be sign language. It might be pecs. It might be augmented communication device. The modality is less important. I would say start with the thing that can be done the fastest. It may not be where you end up, but start with something that you can physically prompt, for example. So it might be touching an augmented communication device to actually physically get the kid to do it so you can hand over the thing so that they learn touching the thing gets me that so that you can get that repertoire up and going. And we've got evidence to suggest that starting with something you know, your probability of ending up with some other modality, you can still get to vocal speech. It doesn't decrease your chances of eventually having the child be able to speak. It just gets communication going and kickstarting it. And that can be really key. So again, I would be kind of simultaneously approaching two things. I would be starting on communication, but really focusing on communication for one or two requests for the things that are most important to her from her perspective. And then at the same time, working on functional assessment to really understand from her standpoint, is there something going on in the environment that seems to be evoking this behavior that then we could um, expand that communication repertoire to address. And it might be to get certain non-preferred things to go away. It might be um, related to other things like, you know, I, I, one of the things that's important to always do is to do a really thorough medical workup to make sure there's nothing going on medically, right? Is there, are there seizures? Are there now, is this kid constipated? Is there some, like I said, dental pain or whatever? All of these things can contribute to problem behavior. So you want to rule all of those things out from the very beginning. And then oftentimes we find that even when those things are ruled out, it doesn't really eliminate the behavior. And that's when you move into really simultaneously working on communication, but really specific and narrow. If, if, if what you're trying to do is eliminate problem behavior, find the handful of requests that are going to be most meaningful for her and then be working on functional assessment. So that would be how I would approach it. Um, I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, the next question that we have is um, from a parent who's asking about their 14 year old daughter. And they're saying that um, she, uh, she is able to speak, so she doesn't have communication uh, challenges, but she has started to pick at herself in multiple places. Uh, he thinks perhaps it could be anxiety, but is asking uh, what you would think. So maybe just to talk a little bit about how do you assess, how do you do a functional assessment to clarify whether that what is what might be driving the behavior? So skin picking is something that I've done a fair amount of work on and it, and it can be really difficult um, and it can be really dangerous. I mean, I have, I have slides of a, of a young man whose whole arm looked like hamburger because he had just picked it to pieces and it you know, high risk for infection and all kinds of problems, scarring, whatnot. Um, so it's a, it can be a really big deal and one you don't want to overlook. Um, it, it is a form of self-injury that is, has a higher probability of being maintained by automatic reinforcement than social reinforcement, right? And you remember that automatic, the behavior is just producing something. It could be reduction of anxiety. That's an automatic reinforcer, right? That just reduce the anxious feelings. It can be sensory or stimulatory in nature. Um, it's the, the problem with these types of automatic reinforcers is it's really hard to isolate the specifics of it. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it always doesn't always really matter a whole lot, right? And because the strategies might be really similar. I also want to be really clear that one should not presume that it's an automatic reinforcer, that there are those scenarios where I've seen examples of behaviors that you would have never thought served a social purpose, but in the end did because kids have learned, you know, in this example, picking at my skin gets a reaction out of somebody. Somebody yells right. or somebody tries to calm me down or, or they've, they've, I've learned that, you know, somebody just to distract me from skin picking has started giving me something I like, right? So there are those possibilities. And even when you don't think it's the case, it may be that, you know, I haven't, you know, once or twice you, you gave the kid somebody something that they like even a long time ago, but kid has a long memory and remembers that one time that somebody gave me a lollipop just to distract me from picking my skin. 
and now you got a skin picker, right? And it's, this is why parenting is, you know, feels impossible sometimes. I feel like <laughs> you never quite anticipate every unintended consequence. But so I wouldn't want to presume something is automatic, um, but it is a high likely, higher likelihood than other types of behaviors like aggression, which are almost always social in nature. And so for those automatic behaviors, oftentimes it is that combination. It's, you know, one of the things I didn't get a chance to talk a whole lot about is there's prevention, right? There's things you can do to prevent skin picking. Well, if it is anxiety, just avoid the thing that causes the anxiety, right? And that's great to a point, but you can't avoid those things forever. What are some other things? Teaching um, ways to self-soothe and whatnot, some functional approaches, also some um, strategies around behavior management to just make it so that it, you're lessening the impact. And that's things like wearing long sleeves if it's picking your arm or what have you. So they just prevent the behavior from occurring, those types of strategies as well. Um, and, and those tend to be relied on more for these behaviors that are maintained by automatic reinforcement than behavioral interventions. Behavioral interventions can be very effective. The young man I told you about who was poking at his eye, again, in some ways not that dissimilar uh, because we didn't have control over it. Whatever was maintaining it, we couldn't control. And so for him, we actually had a neoprene sleeve that was kind of flexible, but we also had some plastic stays in them, these little strips that could keep his elbow somewhat rigid. And so he couldn't get at his eye and it was always with his left arm. And so initially we would put that on his arm and he couldn't get at his eye. And then we would remove one stay after a couple of days and he had a little more flexion in his arm, but he still couldn't reach his eye. And we gradually worked our way down. He had total movement in his arm again, but he still wasn't poking at his eye as long as he had the sleeve on. Maybe started to snip a little bit away every couple of days. Got to the point where it was basically a bracelet. He was wearing a bracelet. It looked like one of those Livestrong bracelets made out of neoprene. And as long as he had his bracelet on, he wasn't poking at his eye. Took the bracelet off, went right back at his eye every time, right? So it's just one of those things where the intervention can be effective even for these automatically maintained behaviors, but they tend to be a little more challenging and I think require a little bit of extra help. So for a young, a young man like that, I think understanding, again, function, maybe uh, automatically maintained, which is going to mean some of these other kind of more default strategies. Don't assume it's maintained by automatic reinforcement. Um, and you may have to rely more on some of the behavior management and prevention strategies. Sure. I think we may Thank be you. at time. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm <coughs> a little All bit right. long-winded. Hey, no, it was a great answer. It's not long-winded because it has multiple applications. I want to remind everybody that this is going to be repeated again tonight at 7 p.m. And at the end of the series, we will have all of these captured together. So I know there was a lot of information, but it was really thorough. So you will all have the opportunity to go back and take out those parts of the presentation that uh, might have some meaning for you or that you'd like to talk to your therapists or family members or team about. So i um, really excited that we got so much information in just 90 minutes. Thank you so much, Dr. Call. This is really outstanding. Um, and we're so glad that we have this relationship with you. Thank you very much. Again, a big thanks to our sponsors. We'll see you next Wednesday uh, for Jimmy Holder, who will be speaking uh, on epilepsy and sleep in PMS. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day. Bye-bye.